Uh, welcome everyone to Love and the Law, an AIP, AIPC Maharashtra event with Karuna Nandi. Um, I would like to um, I would like to invite our state vice president, AIPC state vice president Sumed Gaikwad, to lead us in the preamble of the constitution. Uh, every AIPC event begins by a recital of the preamble. Um, so, Sumed, may, uh, would you please lead us in reciting the preamble? Thank you so much, Mario. Uh, we start the reading of Constitution of India preamble. We, the people of India, we, the people, the of, people, India, people of India, having we solemnly the resolved, having solemnly resolved, resolved, resolved to constitute India, to constitute, to constitute India, India into a, into, into a, a sovereign. Socialist, 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 secular, secular, democratic republic, democratic republic, and to secure to all its citizens, and, and to secure to all, its all its citizens, justice, justice, justice social, 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 economic and political, economic, economic and political, political, liberty of thought. Liberty, liberty of, of thought, thought expression, expression, belief, belief, faith and worship, faith and worship, and worship, worship equality of status, equality of status, status and of opportunity, and, and of opportunity, opportunity, and to promote among them all, and, and to promote, promote among them, among them all, all, fraternity, fraternity. fraternity Assuring the dignity of the individual, assuring, assuring the, the dignity, dignity of the individual, individual, and the unity and integrity of the nation, and, and the unity and integrity, and integrity of, the of the nation. In our constituent assembly, in our, our constituent, constituent assembly, assembly, this twenty-sixth day of November, this twenty-sixth day of November, November, nineteen forty-nine, nineteen forty-nine, do hereby adopt. Do hereby, hereby adopt, adopt, enact, 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 and give to ourselves this constitution. And give, give to ourselves this constitution. Thank you so much. Uh, all to you, Mario. Thank you so much, Sumed, for leading us in the preamble. Um, I would now like to request uh, Alim Javeri, who is the COO of AIPC, to come in and give uh, our audience a short introduction uh, about yourself and the work that AIPC does. Over to you, Alan. Thank you very much, Mario. Thank you, Sumed, for reading out uh, that most beautiful part of our constitution that reiterates our equality and jurisprudence, that we're all equal, not some more equal than others. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to thank you all in AIPC Maharashtra for organizing this event. Uh, AIPC Maharashtra has always been one of our most performing states, and I have no qualms in saying that out of 21 states, I really look forward to Maharashtra's events, um, because you guys have always been at the forefront of not just progress, but also innovation. Uh, so thank you, AIPC Maharashtra. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Karuna Nandi once more to AIPC. The first time uh, I saw her was at an AIPC event organized in Delhi. We happened to share a stage. I don't know if she remembers. I very much do remember. And uh, that was on the triple talaq uh, issue. Uh, and as a, as a person who identifies himself, I am a Muslim. Uh, I cannot stress how much I agree with your viewpoint uh, about what you had said about triple talaq in that particular event. I don't want to repeat it here. I want people to go and watch that video so that we get a little bit of publicity. <laughs> but um, thank you once again. AIPC is the uh, Indian. So AIPC is the youngest, most vibrant department in India's oldest, most established political movement. Um, we are a unit set up specially for professionals, working professionals from across the country. We do not define what a professional is in terms of occupation. We do define, however, certain constituents. You have to be fully employed or you have to be an employer. Uh, you have to pay taxes. That is a prerequisite to join the AIPC. We don't enforce any kind of political affiliation rather than ideological sympathy, as you can see with our constitution. Um, very, very early on in our journey in AIPC, our chairman and deputy chairman, that is Shashi Tharoor and Salman Soz, respectively, along with our national executive, constituted a mandatory 33% reservation for all positions in our leadership to be reserved 
for suitable female candidates. Uh, many instances, we have kept positions vacant uh, for in the absence of a female candidate, and that's something that actually worries me. But um, I hope soon we make that from 33 to 50%. I think that's where we ought to be, and that's where we need to go. Um, beyond that, we are working on a whole bunch of specialist programs. AIPC uh, in the Southern states is now getting into election mode. As you know, we've got elections coming up there. So we're heading a lot of the manifesto consultations. Matthew Anthony, uh, our president in AIPC Maharashtra, also a proud Malayali, um, is very heavily involved in the efforts in Kerala. Matthew and our chairman are working closely there. Um, we also try to bring in new forms of talent and opportunities for people to join, not just the public party, but also the back-end workings. AIPC is your platform for progress. It's your platform for change. And now, with all that's going on in our country, it's more important than ever before for us to reiterate our firm commitment uh, that we all have a duty to agree to disagree within the law. So thank you very much once again. If you haven't joined us already, please do join us. It's completely online, www.profcongress.com. We take a thousand rupees, but it's a lifetime membership. So you pay us a thousand bucks and we have you for life. Thank you very much. And with that, I, I hand over to you, Mario. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Alan, for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> uh, we're very thank grateful you, for your presence here. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I now request uh, AIPC Maharashtra State President Matthew Anthony to um, introduce the event and tell us about all the activities AIPC does in Maharashtra. Over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Mario. My first request is for you to de-stress right now from the first 10 minutes of time. <laughs> and wish you, uh, wish everyone a very happy Valentine's Day evening today because tomorrow we are going for the Valentine's Day celebration. I'll start my early morning with a 3, 3 a.m. flight tomorrow uh, and then roam around in a couple of states. And now, <clears throat> welcome to all the participants. Welcome to the vibrant uh, Karnanandi. And uh, Thank thanks, Alim, for those wonderful words of compliments for AIPG Maharashtra that encourages us. Uh, thanks to Mario. On behalf of the state leadership and the Western region leadership of the regional coordinator, Rajiv Arora, Vice President Sumed, and uh, Zara Parwala, Secretary, I extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, the topic is very interesting. Uh, I have made a tweet the other day. Many wars have been fought to win the love of their life. And we are bringing in restrictions on love in different forms in terms of um, gender inequality, religious limitations. And it's nothing but political. Though, you know, it looks very medieval, very barbaric in terms of its approach. As the world is progressing, we need to change. You know, I remember when I was working with uh, A.P. Muller Maersk, the, the company's uh, founder, Maersk McKinney Muller, his words were written in every frame in every offices. And that was the only thing which is constant in life is change. And if we resist change, the society will go in a retrospective manner. The society will not progress. A lot of our change in the society will happen through the experiences which we go through. And there is no point in restricting love or restricting the love to a gender specific uh, activity and putting in different sorts of limitations. When, when you love someone, it's love. You, you like that person, whomsoever, whatever background, whatever gender, he, she, or you know, the other gender, he, uh, they are. It doesn't, it doesn't matter there. So, and now with this regimen, they are trying to polarize the people also in the form of you know, restricting it through divisive laws of love jihad laws and other things. So we have a very renowned lawyer who has carved out her space um, by remaining a very sophisticated, diplomatic, but fearful activist here. Um, so that is what you know, AIPC is all about. AIPC in Maharashtra, why we get so much of credits is because we are experimenting. We are experimenting with the professional segments to do the outreach. And the only binding principle for us is the Constitution of India and the Constitution of the Congress Party. And as well as, you know, the guiding principle, which is laid down by Mahatma Gandhi, which is Sarvodaya. Sarvodaya is very is our single reply to RSS agenda. If anybody asks us, you know, what is our alternative to the RSS divisive polarized agenda? Sarvodaya is the dream of Mahatma Gandhi, where he has very clearly explained 
the cobbler, the barber of this country and the richest man or the most influential man of the country will have equal states of ownership in this country. Everything is, that's where there is no first amongst the equals, there's no last amongst the equals. A few people who have listened to me earlier might have got tired with this repetition, but this is the founding principle under which we work. We were uh, working with the, uh, uh, with the mentally uh, disabled uh, sector. We were working with the other weekend sections of the society. As AIPC Maharashtra, we are reaching out. Uh, that's what we are doing. And anything and everything which comes to build this equality amongst the people, that's what we represent here. That's all from my end. And everybody is very eager to listen to Karna. So I should not be taking too much of a space time. That's all. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Thank you once again. Thank you, you so man. much, Matthew, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, that really captures a lot of the ideals that AIPC and the Congress Party work towards. So thank you so much. Um, and welcome, Corona, and welcome everybody here to this important conversation with Corona Nandi, who is a renowned Supreme Court advocate and legal expert in the fields of constitutional media, gender, technology, commercial, human rights, and international law. Um, and most importantly, she is an important champion of free speech uh, and the freedom of expression across the world. Corona studied law at Cambridge University and at Columbia University in New York. Her pro bono practice involves um, Supreme Court legislation on, sorry, litigation on the 1984 gas disaster and the toxic waste dumps in Bhopal. Uh, she has also argued cases involving the rights of those accused of terrorism, intellectually disabled people, and class actions on sexual harassment. She drafted contributions to the new anti-rape amendments that passed in 2013 and the Right to Food Act. Food Act. She also recently made it to um, Forbes' list of self-made Indian women in 2020. And besides being a dear friend, she has always been a fearless and unrepentant spokesperson for the LGBTQIA plus community. So welcome, Corona. This event is curated by AIPC Maharashtra. My name is Mario Dapena, and I lead AIPC Maharashtra's committee for LGBTQI plus affairs. I'm really proud that AIPC is participating in this conversation and uh, talking about all these important social issues. This is an old Congress tradition, of course, almost from its inception, delegates to the Indian National Congress also attended the Indian Social Conference to discuss the social reform agendas of that time. So this is a tradition that now needs to be revived. And lately these conversations have become very rare um, as politics becomes solely about winning the next election, but not about building a better society. So we're trying to change things around a little bit here and hopefully this is a step in the right direction. Now, love is one emotion that brings, you know, all human beings together. We all experience it at some point of time in our lives. Yet there are many people in India who don't, ex uh, don't accept um, or acknowledge different kinds of love, sometimes because of ignorance, sometimes because of prejudice. The love of queer people has usually been subjected to this kind of disapproval, but we are not alone in facing that kind of hostility. Uh, increasingly in India, the love between couples who come from different castes and religious backgrounds are also subjected to this kind of uh, politicization. They're attacked they have to flee their homes and they have to approach the courts to restore their rights. So we're here today to talk with Corona about this, these issues and how, um, how to see the connections between the love that crosses the boundaries of gender, sexuality, caste and faith. Um, a quick note on the event, it's divided into two parts. Um, we'll, Corona, in, in the first uh, half, I'll be interviewing uh, Miss Nandi and while the interview is on, you are requested to send in your questions to the moderators in the chat box, and you will be called on in part two to ask these questions yourself. Uh, please keep your questions brief and professional, and we hope to have an open and frank discussion this evening. Without further ado, Corona, we're, about, we're ready to start now. Um, welcome again, and thank you for being here. Now, you've been intimately connected with queer organizing in India for a very, very long time. And what have you observed 
about the different ways in which um, you know the queer community, queer people think about love uh, in India. And why has this love often been subjected to such kind of disapproval from Indian society and even the state? Um, Mario, uh, AIPC Maharashtra, AIPC uh, countrywide, thank you so much for having me. I am truly delighted to be spending part of this Valentine's Day weekend here with everyone. Honestly, I, you know, growing up, I always thought Valentine's Day was completely ridiculous. But today, we have worn red, Mario and I, <laughs> in celebration of Valentine's Day. And um, I think that the more you repress, the more something burgeons in a different direction. Right. And there's a way in which because you had the uh, uh, what a nice background, Motasim Solkar, perhaps we could mute ourselves um, uh, unless we're speaking in questions, etc. I think the more you repress, the more something burgeons. And there's a way in which Valentine's Day itself even if it started out as a greeting card, sort of slightly ridiculous holiday in India, and everyone said it kind of originated from Archie's cards. Today, here we all are celebrating it, right? Um, now, is it in part because there were pub attacks in Mangalore, because the Bajrangal, because other uh, uh, Hindu right-wing organizations were trying to reinforce their idea of love? Um, by, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Solkar's uh, videos front and center is kind of distracting me, though I like the, I like the Milky Way there. Thank you, Mr. That, Solkar. Is that fine? Please come back. Yeah, please come back with a question later. You can also put yourself on mute. Um, there you are. So I think that there's a way in which repression for the third time, repression um, also sort of gives rise to greater celebrations. You know, I think at their at their most positive, right? And we see that in uh, not just our gathering here, but we also see that in the pride parades. You know, we see that in some of the greatest. Um, it, it's one of the most celebratory uh, movements, I think, the queer movement. You know, and I think that is something huge to learn from. Joy to bring joy, because whenever we speak of gender rights, we speak of queer rights, we speak of any rights, you know, too much emphasis is there on limiting violence, you know, or limiting uh, or, or sort of bringing equality with reference to the normative. When we speak of women, bringing uh, equality in reference to men, when we speak of uh, queer couples bringing equality in reference to the heteronormative institution of marriage, right? Um, while I think that these issues are extremely important, right, to have equality across the board and to fight for and to bring equality across the board, I think the, one of the greatest things that the queer movement has brought is a completely inclusive idea of humanity and of love, right? And when I say humanity, I say humanity because I think the essence of humanity is a range of sexualities, a range of um, uh, biology, a range of identity, a range of who or I might be attracted to spiritually or emotionally. Now, these four things don't always match. And that's the point, because I may not be, um, you know, I may be cishet, right? But there may be something else about me still that isn't conforming, actually, you know? Um, and so I think that one of my personally, one of my greatest learnings from the queer movement is um, 
the fact that these boxes that we are constantly policed in, into um, are not determinative. Uh, Santosh Kumar, I'm going to ask you to mute, please. Okay, okay. Thanks. Can everyone just mute, please? We're definitely going to have a, a it's very important, I think, that we have an interaction. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, in this, now, what does that mean? The traditional notion of family, and we in India are big on family, right? Um, the traditional notion is pronormative. It is man marries woman, has children, but also uh, lives with man's parents, right? That's quite a traditional sort of notion. Now, woman leaves family, is done with her natal family, Kanyadan happens, can't go back, even if she's beaten, um, lives with man's parents. So in India, that is the notion of family, right? Another idea of the notion of family, because I'm leading the uh, case in the high court to criminalize marital rape, is according to this government, that the institution of marriage is a compelling state interest and something that the um, government and the courts must protect. And while rape might happen in the institution of marriage, complaining of rape destroys the institution of marriage, right? So they have said that we cannot criminalize marital rape because we must protect the institution of marriage. So therefore, our traditional idea of family also includes a lot of violence, including marital rape within the marital home. Our traditional idea of family doesn't have space for not just same-sex love. And when I, we speak of same-sex love, I think it's really, really important that we adhere to the values of the queer community and speak of the fluid, fluidity of gender and the fluidity of sexuality but, and the, uh, in both couples, right? So, I was just looking at the prayers in the various petitions that seek to legalize um, marriage between two people who are not man and women, woman. And I think, I, I, I wish that they didn't primarily speak of same-sex love or same-sex marriage. I wish they spoke of only of marriage regardless of gender and regardless of sexuality, you know? Now this brings me to the, my second big learning from my uh, sort of deep connection um, with, you know, with the queer community and queerness and my, my community of friends. Um, and it is that family should and can be chosen. That um, I see Tiju Thomas here, and which is just fantastic because I just read your paper, Tiju Thomas. Uh, and Professor Thomas is a, a professor of engineering when he wrote that paper, but he spoke of creating a legal framework where you can have families that are not just these man, woman, or, you know, not even man, man, or woman, woman families, you know, where you can have families that are different, where you can have families that are chosen. A lot of we've seen, and not just in because one is queer or, you know, LGBT identifies as LGBTQIA+, um, that you are sort of thrown out of the family. Right? And that those family ties are severed. And so the new family structures, whether it's the hijra community or whether it's um, other sort of chosen family structures, that the legality around that is missing. And so I would love for, I would love for Professor Thomas to speak of his idea, which is much more contractual. But I also think that um, 
there are ways in which now, existing ways in which um, those who do not choose to assimilate into the, into the heteronormative structures of marriage and family can organize their affairs. So we have common friends, for example, who will remain unnamed, um, who, have, uh, who have chosen to live in a family structure where they share a home and they intend to include each other in each other's wills. And there is a way in which you can, you can nominate people in uh, insurance. There are lots of ways in which you can say that, look, this person is my family. Right. It's just that it's not the default. And so it takes a lot of work. And another thing that, I, you know, is quite clear in the law is that when law comes from a sort of privileged law, uh, elite lawmaking, um, whether it is constitutional in the area I work in and a sort of constitutional Supreme Court judgment or another way of making law um, or an ordinance. I think that law that is born out of mass movements and politics finds much greater buy-in, which is why I am delighted to see this committee rooted in politics. And you are better people, better folks than me, because I find it very difficult to sort of ally with a, with a huge uh, organization because, you know, I feel that if there's something I disagree with, then I can't. But I think it's so important because uh, in this allyship is how we make change. In this allyship is how we uh, uh, organize best, really, you know, to defeat of fascist forces, whether that fascism is with regard to what our sexuality is, who we love, who our family is, and um, how we live. No, thanks so much, Corona, for that. And I think uh, that's such a wonderful point about allyship. You know, allyship has always been going in multiple directions. Um, there has always been this crossover between the feminist uh, movement and feminist organizing and queer organizing. And, you know, there's, we all learn so much from each other. And I think uh, the party structures are also close to that kind of allyship. And I think uh, we're, at a, we're at a very significant moment in India's history where we're trying to, you know, determine what the road ahead is. And, you know, as you said, we have to fight against fascism, but that fight is going to be multi-pronged. Yes, there are, you know, there are farmers on the borders of Delhi right now, but the fight against fascism is also, you know, in, in, in challenging what these ideas, these state notions of what a family looks like, what love looks like, um, you know, so I think that kind, you and you've been witness to that kind of, um, of conversation between feminism and um, the queer and queer organizing, but also, um, you know, conversations with between feminism, queer organizing and party structures. You've been involved in, you know, in uh, efforts to change the law. So, you know, and right now we're confronted with all these different um, challenges to, for instance, within marriage rights. There aren't any marriage rights for queer people in India, but that's only one small part of the equation. There are, there's also the question, as you said, of recognizing different kinds of families that may not be just two men living or two women living with each other. Uh, so where are we on this range of, um, this range of uh, things that sort of come within this, the ambit of anti-discrimination and the law? That's a big question. Sorry. So queer theory has always been. Let, let's look at let's look at the issue doctrinally first. Let, let's take a step back, right? And queer theory has always been um, sort of very closely connected to gender theory in a way that in when it emerged in sort of in the early 1990s and correct me if uh, I'm wrong, Mario, you're, you have a PhD in this, but um, it built on 
gender theory in a sense. It kind of emerged from gender theory in a sense, right? I mean, there were, of course, the Fugoldian understandings of uh, queer theory, but with Judith Butler, uh, Eve Sedgwick et al., that, that sort of intellectual and academic movement emerged much later, right? Now, I think that the two are inextricably connected. And the reason I think that this is true is um, because if you are saying that something should happen regardless of gender, right? It's a very tough argument to then say that that thing should only be limited to men and women, you know? Intellectually, it's a very tough argument, you know? Um, and I would love for someone to make it and then let's have a bit of um, if, if you have thoughts on If you do have contrary thoughts on that later. Now, quite apart from the fact that when you speak of feminism, obviously you also speak of queer women, whether women are lesbian or whether women are um, pansexual or bisexual or, you know, have fluid sexuality, whatever, uh, intersex, uh, 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 female identifying people, you know, trans exclusion has not really been a feature of Indian feminism. It is a feature of white fem feminism, of some white liberal feminism. Let's not uh, them all with the same brush, but it hasn't really been a feature of Indian feminism, you know. Um, in my work, uh, we had the Woman Manifesto in 2014, right? And the Woman Manifesto is, was basically six points that I truly believe had it been implemented. And it was, in a sense, one of the sort of, you know, every movement goes through peaks and troughs. And this was one of the peaks of the feminist movement um, after the rising that came after, uh, came post Nirbhaya in uh, 2000 and 2012, right? Um, the new anti-rape laws came in in 2013, and then the election was coming, and uh, the, the you know then prime ministerial candidate Modi had huge billboards saying "Bahut hua nari parvar, ab ki baar Modi sarkar," right? Which is something I bring up a lot now in TV debates. Now the point is that at that point, um, a large number of us together, and I was one of the sort of main people there brought together something called the Wu Manifesto, which we had envisaged as a common minimum program that everyone should sign up to. And if they did, then they could hold each other accountable in parliament, like a common minimum program, right? Because I absolutely think that gender rights, queer rights that I think include each other, you know, um, are political. People say, oh, let's put politics aside. And if there was a rape in Madhya Pradesh and if there is a rape in Kerala, these are two different things. No, they're not. You know, gender is political. And so here, one of the points front and center was repeal 377. You know, um, the Congress signed up to it and included it in your uh, manifesto at the time. Um, the Ahmadmi Party signed up to it. Uh, we met with Nirmala Sitaraman and some other BJP leaders. Um, and what we were told essentially was that, look, we, A, we have our own women's agenda, and B, the RSS is not ready for, uh, you know, the RSS is not, not by Nirmala Sitaraman at this point, but the RSS is not quite ready for decriminalizing 377, right? We just read the constitution. It doesn't matter if the RSS is ready. You know? um, the RSS can take things at their own pace. It's you know in their personal lives, um, but they have to limit it to their personal lives. Now, with regard to the 377 hearings, however, the Congress always had the opportunity. And I see so many dynamic uh, people here sort of, you know, taking these issues and talking about these issues. And I would really like this sort of energy that I see here sort of to come into policy and the top leadership, right? Um, the Congress always had an opportunity to get rid of 377, you know, because 
the after the de in 2009 section 377 was gotten rid of with regard to same, same sex right now in 2013 the hearings were still going on until 2013 now just because it's been done by the High Court, as we have seen in Triple Talaq, as Alim and I discussed. Doesn't mean you can't pass a legislation. You can pass a legislation and you can say, look, we're going to cut this hearing short because we as parliament, we as a secular socialist democratic republic are going to take a stand and we are going to say that all people are created equal. And it didn't happen. And in 2013, when Justice Singhvi recriminalized, who recriminalizes something, you know, when he recriminalized in the Supreme Court, uh, sex between uh, the same gender sex, um, that was another opportunity. I truly believe that the alternative that we must present voters and the polity is something that is not like Modi, Shah, Ambani, Ardani, you know? That it's got to be something that is completely different. That there is a large mass of people that is voting for these people on the grounds of religion, yes. But they are also voting because they see no alternative right now. They don't see enough of a difference. The reason I believe that Hillary Clinton lost is because she wasn't actually different enough from Trump, you know? And I'm not saying that the Congress is not different enough. I'm just saying that there is a reason that 53% of Americans identified as socialist back in that last election. The young Americans, sorry, identified as socialist in that last election. And there is a sort of large um, groundswell of people that believe that elites have had their day and enough's enough. And that uh, it can't just be about elites and elites espousing the cause of the poor. You know, the poor that it's got to be about everybody. It's got to be about middle-class traders and it's got to be about uh, people who are not big, who are you know, working a number of, you know, huge numbers of hours and not being able to uh, sell their produce at a good price and are not being able to send their children to schools that are worth the name and are not being able to get adequate healthcare without, selling or mortgaging their land or falling into the hands of ridiculously huge landowners. One of the alternative visions I think here is something that you here can lead. It is an alternative vision of love. Queerness is not just about same sex as we just spoke. Queerness is also about um, my being able to fall in love with a Muslim and not worry about them being prosecuted. Queerness is also about my not being married and having a child and not being worried about being called, uh, you know, a whore or somebody who's outside of society. Queerness is about intercaste marriage and getting the protection, not needing the protection of the court because the police is with you so that you don't have to go to court. Do you know the tiny number of people who are able to get a competent lawyer and are able to approach a high court in rich jurisdiction? It's really, really slender. So given the fact that a police force is at the moment almost inextricable from the state, the police has got to be a force that is, and this is in the Wu Manifesto, I urge you to refer to it, is recruited, promoted, and penalized on the basis of constitutional values, on the basis of their ability and their willingness to enforce constitutional values, right? Because if you just keep recruiting people on the basis of you are going to get people who are beating people and running after people fast, right? That's what you're going to get. Um, and so I think this alternative vision 
and i think that rahul gandhi actually has that hug i really like that hug i think that rahul gandhi has somewhere also got that that spirit in him um you know regardless of whether or not he's going to lead your party and i think that there are other sort of leaders of your party that also have that spirit in them um in in kind of being clear that any leadership will be of leadership of all people not just regardless of um you know religion and caste and faith etc but but also regardless of political affiliation you know that that love has to reach across political lines because we are a, a grossly divided polity now and these schisms are uh, schisms that have been created in part because of narrow political strategic interests but also because those narrow political strategic interests align with a vision of the world that is um that believes and we have to understand this without vilifying that view that believes in these schisms that believes in let me put it in a different way that believes in the comfort and predictability of structure that believes in the values that they grew up with you know that believes in loyalty that believes in that my religion is something that i should be proud about that uh, you know i saw something recently where they said ki christian kehte hain ki uh, you know jesus is the son of god or muslim kehte hain ki muslim uh, muslim pray to allah lekin bas hindu hi kehte hain ki ishwar allah tero naam right sabko sanmati de bhagwan now that is where they're coming from you know and i think only a deep understanding of that and proposing an alternative vision that is something that will perhaps emerge in part out of some of these conversations and must be rooted in everybody's lived real lived realities right um is something that uh, okay i uh, mara i see you saying that okay let's go get on to the next question no no um, not at all okay but i think that that is something that um will truly sort of resonate with with you know i was in uh, uttarakhand recently and i was speaking to a divorced woman who is living with her family and is one of the most successful farmers in her um village there's a huge amount of jealousy and when there's jealousy then they speak of her marital status and all this rubbish right uh father's very proud of her mother said my came me padi hui hai ladki so we were talking about modi and uh, it was interesting because the father said that matlab zindagi to hame khud banani hai ek margdarshak chahiye right so this positing of the long beard and atmanirbhar bharat at the same time is extremely precise forensic and really quite brilliant because who votes against their religious guru will you ever sack your religious guru no you won't you can't it's not your place right and that is the biggest damage that has happened to our democracy today because what is broken is the link between the citizen and the state and the ability to question not just because of the crackdown on free speech but also because why are these people constantly questioning the guru you know and atmanirbhar bharat is about how i have to make my own life the so government kya karega the government kabhi kuch kar nahi payega पहले कम से कम एक्सपेक्ट करते थे अब तो वो भी नहीं है यू नो डस दैट आंसर योर क्वेश्चन नो आई थिंक सो सर्टेनली आई थिंक आई रियली लाइक हाउ यू प्रेजेंटेड दिस एज एन अल्टरनेटिव विजन दैट हैज टू यू नो वर्क ऑन डिफरेंट काइंड्स ऑफ लेवल्स एंड जस्ट द आइडिया दैट दैट यू नो दिस अल्टरनेटिव विजन डसेंट स्टॉप एट 
the gates of same sex love you know it's there's so many other so many other people who you may be cisgender you may be heteronormative you may be heterosexual and you are still part of this uh, alternative vision because the alternative vision is one of choice it is it is one you know that affirms Precisely. yeah it affirms you know not liberty freedom your freedom exactly yeah. so and that's i think through this committee we also want to make that you know that claim that yes we are a committee for lgbtqia plus affairs but we're not that's not where we stop we, we want to present that alternative vision which includes you know people who don't have that choice in india today either because they choose to you know marry somebody or be with somebody outside their caste group or religious group and then the the long hands of the state come and prevent them so that's the kind of intersection we want to build um that's the kind of intersection i know you feel very strongly about could you say more about you know about those kinds of linkages I'm sorry Mario what was the last bit I uh... I said the the linkages you know that we don't stop at just same sex love there are linkages between people whose choices are you know are curtailed because they love somebody of their own gender but also people whose liberties are curtailed because they love somebody from another caste group or another religious group so I want you to speak to those kinds of intersections I think a lot of the work at the moment is the work of resistance because through I mean there are these love jihad laws right that in four states uh uh essentially telling people that they can't marry across religious lines you know that people are, that and in effect what's happening is that they're going they're making it really hard for um anyone to marry a muslim man for women for hindu women in particular to marry muslim men like that's how it's working right uh what a lot of people don't know is that the special marriage act also requires the same kind of publication of the intent to marry and the ability for the mob to come to your house so i have um you know i've been approached by couples uh, unfortunately i don't do that kind of work so i've only advised and put them on to someone else um <laughs> i'm just making it clear here. but saying that look i don't i want to get married under the special marriage act but i don't want to sort of publicize this and give the bajrang the family is all happy everyone's all good but to give some kind of um hindu rakshadal the opportunity to come to my doorstep or my you know my future parents in law doorsteps or my family or whatever i don't want to do this and so happily all of this is um notice has been issue i see nikhil parwal asking a question this is one of the the right to privacy is one of the arguments that is the, one of the constitutional arguments that is being made in this challenge to the hindu marriage act um, uh, to the special marriage act right um and to the love jihad ordinances you know so the nine judge bench on privacy like this is one of the arguments that is being made front and center it's very important because the right to privacy is not just the right for someone not to know what i am doing it is also the right to have a free range of choice you know it is the right to choice in sexuality it is the right to choice in who or whether i marry it is the right to decide on my body for uh, with regard to abortion um it is the right to think whatever i will on a search on the internet you know the informational decision making right um so as i was saying i think a lot of the work at the moment because the fascists are galloping ahead with their agenda to limit choice right so i think that the, the ethno religious fascists so it's a very particular type of fascism um so the requirement therefore is uh that a positive view be 
articulate it, that it not it, it that it's not just about resistance. By the way, when we speak about resistance, I think that um, uh, I, I hope Alim's still here and many of you are still here. You know, one of the things I think that the AIPC can do that is really, really, really important is organize lawyers. You know, is to organize lawyers and have lists of really, really competent people that you can have faith in that will, um, some of whom may not charge, some of whom might charge, some of whom might charge a little bit that can all be made clear, who can do the work of upholding these constitutional values from the district level to the Supreme Court. And I think this is really important because I've had this idea from time to time to sort of do this organization and I've never had the time or the, um, you know, organizational bandwidth. I, uh, um, I'm not an institution builder, you know? There are people who are, I'm not one of them. But you all are. And I think that that's something that you could do because AIPC is a professional's organization, right? And so I think in terms of contribution, this could be a huge one. And I know that, uh, I think Alim is a lawyer um, and Matthew is a lawyer, of course. And so even in the, even Mario in your group, you know, um, in your committee, if you had like a legal cell um, and that legal cell was across the country, how amazing and useful could it be? Particularly if you espouse a um, wide conception of queerness. So in terms of, uh, now let's come to a positive vision. And when we speak of a positive vision, one of the things that Professor Tiju's paper kind of triggered for me was to look at, to bring into the law, right? Through uh, alternative, a family that has structured itself in an alternative way, that is not blood related, that is not even polyamorous, that there's, you know, that there may not be any sex within that family structure, that may be all otherwise referred to as friends, but choose to make each other family, right? Want to be each other's next of kin. Um, some of them may be related, some of them may be a couple, whatever. And to take that, to bring that into the law, you know? Because at the moment we see more of a move towards equalizing homosexual, and I say the word, I use the word in a very specific way, homosexual rights to heterosexual rights, right? And so do we want everyone to be hurtling towards marriage? Of course, that is something that must be available to gay couples, you know? But the whole point of the queer movement and is that it is not merely assimilationist, that it is also creating a vision of the world that is different. And in this positive um, vision, creating law is something that can also happen, actually, Matthew, at the state level, you know? It can also happen, you know, some of this can happen at the state level because some of these are uh, maybe in the concurrent list, some of these issues, right? And some of these may not have laws at the central level that are repugnant to the... Um, to the law that you might want to create at the at the state level, you know? So the Congress being in power at the state level, I think that this, this gives rise to some very, very real possibilities. Um, and I will support the, I will support all these uh, movements and in the, towards these efforts uh, if I feel it's actually gonna happen. <laughs> No, thanks. That's really, I think that's great to hear. I was about to ask you about, you know, what a political party like the Congress or an organization like AIPC could do. And I think you spoke to that uh, very well. Uh, we're going to go into um, questions and comments. But before that, uh, I think Matthew has raised his hand and would like to say something. Matthew, um, 
I'm asking you to unmute. Thanks, Mario. Uh, I just want to specifically come and answer Karuna here that uh, we have a national legal cell which is hmm. doing the capacity building and we are already providing uh, free pro bono services to the farmers in Delhi. And whenever crisis happened in other parts of the country also we have provided, but we are doing the capacity building and outreach in however ways you can contribute towards that one, uh, either by uh, associating with us or you know, remaining independent and offering a service. We'll be most happy to have your expertise coming in there for us. And from the state side also, we will be forming something in the state. You know, uh, we will be having a lawyers group formed in the state of Maharashtra also. That we'll be doing in, immediately after this one. See, yeah. that's fantastic, Matthew. Because you know, I think all it really takes is setting up an initial WhatsApp group, not WhatsApp signal. Setting up an initial <laughs> signal group, right? I've moved almost all my groups, <laughs> um, and preliminary on a preliminary basis. And then how do we look when I'm representing a huge company, okay, that has lots of money sloshing about for legal fees. And they have a case in um, Kolhapur. This actually happened in Kolhapur. What do I do? I call somebody that I trust in Bombay. Okay. A lawyer that I trust in Bombay working in that particular area. And I say, listen, do you know somebody fantastic in Kolhapur? Um, I call actually three or four lawyers either working in Bombay or somebody in the Supreme Court who has links to Maharashtra, right? I, from this, I generate like two, three names and in Kolhapur, and then I speak to them. I basically do an interview without appearing to interview, you know, and then I uh, go with one, right? Sometimes with another as a backup to keep an eye, to be honest, okay? So now, in the same way, it's actually completely possible, I think, to, because this is, you know, I'm mean, smiling because you know this is how we do it, right? Um, to create a cadre, a district level cadre of lawyers, so that if somebody has gone and attacked somebody in Kola, so when, uh, uh, when uh, this recent incident happened in Indore, I got a call the same night, right? Um, I found someone in five minutes, but I think that that particular person had a lot of offers of legal uh, representation. I think we know who we're speaking of. And so he got legal representation immediately and he didn't go with the person that the person who had called me had recommended, right? So what I'm saying is that if at the district level we can do this, then the ability to move fast will be there. One big one thing that hasn't been cracked is how to replicate, look, the nature of fascism is good organization and structure, right? So when you're progressive, you're not going to get the same kind of, the organization is not going to come through the same source of discipline, you know? But it's got to be, I think the rigor of organization and the effectiveness is something that has got to be there. Um, and I think we should look very closely at other countries and how some of those countries are winning the fights against fascism. I'm actually referring to somebody who just asked the question, I think it was Dr. Anwar. Um, for example, in in the United States, I think that one of the reasons that the Biden-Harris combo won is because they posited an alternative vision. They weren't hesitant to lead and, you know, to espouse the Black Lives Matter movement. And in a very serious way, you know, that it wasn't just a soft sort of here, a soft Hindutva or there, a soft, uh, you know, Trumpism, though God knows that there's a lot of that around. Um, I think we've got to look at the kind of work people like Stacey Abrams have been doing in Georgia. You know, there's lots of studies saying that door to door campaigning is incredibly effective. So in legal organizing, um, I think that making people feel part of a community giving due recognition 
um, being effective and having people involved in results that they can be proud of can really work. And I'm not going to I'm not going to ally with the Congress, <laughs> but um, you can be assured of my support uh, if there is a case that you want represented, or if you want legal advice, or you know, this is provided it's going to go somewhere. You know, this yeah. is what I was speaking of, right? Like that thing of like it's got to go somewhere. It's got to be effective in terms of the result. You know. Yeah. No, we'll definitely call on you for that, uh, Corona. Please, please. Um, I'll ask Arlen to come in. He has uh, he's raised his hand. So, sorry, Arlen, one sec. Unmute, Arlen. Yeah, sorry about that. So I just wanted to drop one bombshell because I thought now better than ever. Um, I, few of us in AIPC, uh, in fact, nobody in this group will actually know about this, but few of us in AIPC have been working on uh, a very serious reform that is long overdue. Now we brought in 33%, as I'd mentioned earlier, but uh, I have a lot more skin in this game than most people realize. A lot of us have skin in this game personally, because some of us uh, are the product ourselves of interreligious marriages or intercultural marriages or caste marriages or whatever. Right, right. But I'm pleased to say that very soon AIPC will be announcing a group comprised entirely of women, which is already exists. They're already talking, we're already working on uh, various issues. Uh, I will not reveal who's a part of that group right now because I've not taken their permission to reveal their identities. But it's a bunch of professionals from across our entire unit from Kanyakumari to Kashmir. Um, and it's called AIPC Resolve. And the idea of this group is to dedicate itself 150% towards equality of opportunity for all people. Mm -hmm. So not just LGBTQ, uh, it's, it's, it's issues of pride, it's issues of identification and it's, it's, it's issues of acceptance. The priority for us um, is to create a sense of community and that community has to create a sense of safety. You know, there needs to be this, we need to institutionalize and make AIPC across the organization a safe space. And if we can do it in the AIPC, it permeates into the Congress. You know, I'm gonna be very clear and say that, you know, we talk about all these things. We're the only department in the entire Congress party that actually has 33%. No other department in the Congress party has that. Now, I'm not saying that it, it's some sort of noblesse oblige where, you know, we must, as men, we give this sort of sense of ownership. It's absolutely wrong. But I want to reiterate to you all that the national executive of AIPC will be making a lot of changes very soon. AIPC resolve will be a reality. And we hope that by AIPC doing it, it has its effect in the Pradesh Congress committees. That's the really grassroots level political units. It has a recognition and more than anything else, um, there's one person who was a member of that group. I don't want to, again, reveal that person's identity. I can see that person smiling. But I will say that there is going to be a huge change that's going to come. And it's going to completely change the way the Congress party sees itself, which yeah. is the most important thing for us, is that we have to change the way we see ourselves and our, and our capacity to, to, to do good. Um, and I, I, you know, I want to compliment Matthew for, for, for reaching out and, and, and sort of making that thing to you very clearly. But we'd also like to make sure, Miss um, Nandi, that we can associate with you on issues of resolve. So it's not just legal cases, it's also policy issues. We want to petition our states, we want to petition wherever we have the ability to do, to, to do change, we want to petition our colleagues so that change happens ASAP, not wait yeah. till the next general election and then hope and pray for change thereafter. That's, yeah. for some people, myself included, uh, fascism is a matter of life and death. Yeah, so absolutely. We have, you know, we have skin in the game. We realize the seriousness of that. So I'm just going to leave it at that. But thank you so much. Um, I have got to get on to another call. There's another one on the on the economy with Salman Soz and Amitabh Dubey. So with your permission, I'd like to thank you once again on behalf of the AIPC. I'm going to bow out. I've got to get on to the other call. But thank you very much. And if there's anything anyone needs, I saw some people want to get in touch with me. My email ID is on the website. Uh, please feel free to contact me and I'll be very happy to help. Thank you once again. I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you, Alim. Uh, Matthew, did you have something to come in with? You, you have a raised hand. No, I think, you know, Alim has completed, you know, what I had to say. You know, so you know, I think, you know, there's nothing more. Thanks, uh, Karuna. So, you know, we'll, we'll be positively working towards it. Wonderful. Okay. And at this point, then, I'd like to call on, call on my colleagues, uh, Francis de Costa and Sham Konor, to come and, uh, you know, lead us with the questions. Karuna, just 10 to 10 minutes of questions. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much.
May I request Kamna Behrani to ask a question, please? Kamna, can you unmute yourself? I can hear you. Carry on. I'm asking Kamna to come. She has a question. Kamna. Oh, One I'm minute. sorry. I'll, I'll unmute her. Hello. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, hello, Miss Nandi and everyone. Hi, Kamla. Hi. Uh, so, I would like to ask a question. Firstly, I would like to uh, thank everyone for organizing this webinar. So, uh, secondly, my question is, um, as you know that we have Hindu Marriage Act and Special Mar Marriage Act governing marriage uh, between heterosexual couples. In your opinion, if a personal law were to be recognized for homosexual couples, do you think traditional traditional rights for performing marriage ceremony in a conventional society like India would be possible? Um, I think there are a few things that presumption there come now. Um, I don't think a personal law is required for a traditional ceremony to be recognized. Let's keep in mind that there is already a Madras High Court judgment that says that if you are, if one person is trans and female identifying therefore, and is marrying a man, that is a legitimate marriage, right? That already exists. So that is a marriage that can already happen um, with religious rights. You just have to find a find the appropriate uh, officiant to do it if you want the religious rights. So, you know, presumably you can do it yourself with religious rights, right? And then just get a, go and register the certificate. Um, the fight in the Delhi High Court that's coming up now on the 25th of, uh, of February, um, notice has already been issued, the government hasn't responded, is about the constitutional recognition that same-sex couples have the right to marry. And so once you have the right to marry, then the question is, again, as I said, um, either devising your own religious ceremony or getting a religious, because why should religion only be placed in the hands of those who claim to be its guardians, right? Why can't we all claim our own versions of religion, you know, and perform our own ceremonies, right? If we are stepping away from Brahminism, why can't we perform, a, sort of learn whatever mantras we wish and conduct our own Hindu ceremonies, similarly for other religions, if we wish to engage with the religious aspect of um, the marriage, right? Yes, yes, rightly said, rightly said, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Should the next question? Let's, why don't we ask, uh, you know, Tiju to speak? Okay. Tiju, if you'd like to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Are you all able to hear me? We can, yes. Oh, good. Uh, could, you, you very... could you make it a bit louder? Is there a way? Yes. Are you able to hear me, Advocate Nandi? We can hear you. If it's a bit louder, it'd be great. But otherwise, you know, you can we can raise hear. your mic. Okay. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Please speak. Okay. First of all. Hi. Hi. Greetings. Greetings. And thank you for reading my paper and uh, seeing prospects through that. So um, I have just a simple question. Uh, so you had mentioned about the possibility of taking something like a deed of familial association as was mentioned in the paper at the state level. And uh, in the state level items that are available, there's something called public order, which seems to be sort of the closest to uh, what is being proposed here, isn't it? So would mm -hmm. that be the way to make this move if we had to make this move at the state level? Not quite, okay. because public order is a sort of, is basically law and order, right? But at a larger scale. So while some people think that public order is just making sure that A doesn't kill B, it's not actually that. It's mm. about something larger. It's like a riot, mm. you know? Mm. So while in our conceptions of uh, how people are trying to control others, you know, it's based on public order, I can see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. But the legal definition of public order, it comes, for example, from... Um, the Ramesh Thapar judgment, which mm. was pre-amendment of uh, pre-First Amendment, 
I see. of the constitution I see. and essentially with the first amendment it was Ramesh Thapar and Bridge Bhushan on free censorship that they were trying to get rid of right. you know right 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 I see. um subsequently the various judgments of public order uh, say that there must be a spark in the powder keg to that sparks public order if you are mm-hmm. to limit for example speech or assembly um on the grounds of that particular source of legitimate compelling state interest right? Right. um with regard to that one of the examples that we're making you know as an example of how the relationship between queer law and the querying of the law and its benefits all around is that in the marital rape case we are saying we are quoting nalsa mm-hmm. nalsa judgment yeah. and we are saying that there is an article 19 right a free mm-hmm. freedom of speech right freedom of speech and expression right that you mm-hmm. are taking away from me when mm-hmm. you take away my right to say no mm-hmm. no to sex with my husband you are taking away my right to say yes mm-hmm. you see right. because when i can't say no i am reduced to a legal subject and a sexual object and somebody who is incapable of expressing her wish towards sexuality right right and in this regard therefore we have men's groups that have engaged in our petition and who are mm-hmm. saying contrary to the men's so called men's rights associations who are saying that oh there will be fake cases against us right they are saying that we are married to women who are equal partners mm-hmm. and our equal partners must have the ability to say a joyful yes to mm-hmm. us you know right uh, just another th- thought just to be share which i think might be somewhat helpful uh, <clears throat> so we are signatories of the undhr uh, india as a country the united nation declaration of human rights and as part of the undhr one of the articles uh, explicitly talks about the right to family and it comes under the right to privacy very interestingly so within the jurisprudence as is exercised in within undhr that sort of the structure that is taken and we have already in our country made moves towards protection of privacy it has been sort of nested under the overarching way in which dignity is interpreted etc cetera, etc cetera. so is it possible for us to sort of make a case um, moving in this direction uh, towards having something like a dfa the deed of familial association so using the fact that there are elements that are already there to which we are signatories of internationally so uh, in the process making a even better case uh, you know a case uh, that takes into account the internal story of india but also the fact that india is uh, i mean a member of the united nations it would always be a ground tijo the thing is that my concern about taking a case like this to court mm. right mm. is that it would be rather than through the legislative process mm. is that we're essentially asking for like a whole range of things to be recognized right right right, right. um so we're asking therefore then we'd be would it be akin to asking for legislation it is a legislation no we have to move so then it's akin to and you can't yes. courts can't legislate yes yes it cannot be through court but i'm sure that they okay. will look at the logic that is used to argue for the legislation of this sort if it is sort of furthered isn't it yeah but then where is the opportunity to argue that in court if it's already a legislation like it's only against the challenge that if it's already a legislation then there's a presumption of constitutionality like a bill, you know it has to be something like a bill if we yeah to... i think you and mario and i should make it yeah why not and i think matthew should take it to what's a good state no i've been really amazed at this uh, you know tiju in is... maharashtra yeah no right? I... because the shiv sena actually <laughs> is uh and i have a meeting coming up with some with uh, uh it's an unofficial meeting so i won't speak about it with one of the shiv sena leaders um and they approve themselves to be much more progressive than than one ever thought right wonderful 
Wonderful. So consider it as a bill folks AIPC mm-hmm. Maharashtra mm-hmm. excellent no um no i'm uh, tiju thank you so much tiju just to let everybody else know um wrote an email with his paper recently that i forwarded to corona that was the paper on the deed of familial association they were talking about in the discussion just now um uh, tiju thank you so much for making it to the um to the meeting today and i'm glad you could bring it up uh but i wanted sham to come in and maybe direct a couple more questions to corona and then we can call it an evening sure thank sham you. you have to speak up thank you tiju thank you uh, i was think i see matthew has a question oh go for it matthew No, it's not a question. I said no. That no, we'll take it up with Maharashtra after she completes her unofficial meeting with the Shiv Sena leaders. Amazing. Okay, great. I I don't know if my Shiv Sena leaders powerful enough. I mean, I think they, yeah. You See, know. Uh, whether you know, uh, Karuna, I think you know, you will agree that a lot of things you know which we start initiating, we may not be able to see the results the moment we start pushing it. But no, we have to make a beginning somewhere, and then no, start keep pushing it you know, till the time the envelope reaches its destination. That's the way I look at it in politics. That's true. Uh, I completely yeah. agree with you. That's I agree with is. you, but at the same time, I do think that we should aim for victory. Yes, and we will. Victory and a quick victory, right? Yes. <laughs> time bound, a time bound <laughs> victory when we are in power. I agree with you. That's great. Um, Sham, go for it. Uh, also i think bhaskar uh, has a hand up so yeah. maybe after yeah. for a long time bhaskar is waiting yeah. bhaskar do you want to go for it yeah am i audible to you yes yes, yes. yeah Put your video on if you can yeah yeah ma'am sure i hope you can see me now as well i think yes hello hello ma'am uh, good evening uh, i good hope evening. Uh, no, i i was just basically like, since i am a law student i am also reading and doing a lot of things so i was just understanding so even post navdeep singh jor we never saw a lot of changes in lot of acts that needs uh, that gives benefits or as same benefits as uh, recognized by a heteronormative family so i was just thinking that in the recent uh, ongoing case as well in the delhi high court solicitor general kind of made it very clear that the our laws and our society kind of doesn't recognize these kind of same sex marriages so even if if the high court kind of gives them uh, give them the legal recognition under either under sma or or some other laws so i was just wondering uh, how how do you, how do you see that well, because to give them the same benefits as a heteronormative family government needs to amend a lot of laws in terms of pension in terms of gratuity in terms of uh, bank accounts and uh, and apl- legacy yeah and 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 plethora of laws so i and and government is not very keen because if the, the government was keen on on these topics so then they must have done something or post navte singh or which we kind of never saw coming in in the last few years so how how do you see even if the ongoing case gives them the recognition under sma or 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 another laws so how how do you see change in in pride in in same sex in lgbt community coming as as uh, and giving them same recognition in uh, as as enjoyed by a heteronormative family i think that um a bigger source of general non discrimination is nalsa you know so read nalsa um because what nalsa says is that and it's it's pre navte johar navte johar obviously draws on it and what it says is that you have to uh, provide in policy and you know you have to provide for equality across the board right um so there's a positive obligation on states in nalsa that doesn't exist in navte johar the point about navte johar is of course the constitutional principles are there in navte johar right um also in um the privacy in chandrachur's judgment in uh, justice chandrachur's judgment in um puttaswami yeah when he basically got rid of nas right <laughs> um even though it wasn't the list which i thought was important um but um Mario and I were just speaking before the the talk and we were saying that you know once 
sexual activity was decriminalized, marriage is not going to be so far behind because Indian society is not going to let you run around having sex outside of the confines of marriage so easily, you know. So, so I think there's a way in which once sex is available, marriage comes in Indian society much more easily. Once marriage comes, then children come that much more easily, you know. So there's a way in which in the absence of le legislation through litigation uh, on constitutionality, these steps can be, uh, I mean, it, it can be a step-by-step -step process. Though, of course, I think in general, a non-discrimination legislation is absolutely vital. And it's something that the leader of the AIPC, Shashi Tharoor, has um, tabled as a private member's bill. We know private member's bills don't go anywhere. This is in um, furtherance of Matthew's point, right? That you have to propose something and then, then it becomes a thing. So sometimes you table something just to table it, just to bring it on the legislative radar, right? And to hope that the treasury benches will take it up, you know? Um, in some form, maybe adopt it in their own form, maybe later, right? Or maybe when you are in government that you take it up, you see? Um, so the non-discrimination legislation is something that was um, basically pioneered by an Oxford academic, a, a gay Oxford academic, a queer Oxford academic called Tarunab Khetan. And uh, he's a lawyer and he's now head of the human rights um, thing there. Yeah, yeah, Oxford University, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so basically what it says and the argument it makes is that there's got to be a sort of non-discrimination can't just be a constitutional touchstone, right? It also has to be legislative. It's very important so that there's something very concrete that the courts can refer to and that there's also an affirmative obligation on government to um, to perpetuate that, that through. And you know, we're also doing it, I spoke of the manifesto, we're doing it, for example, in the anti-sexual harassment policies for some companies. Uh, we make sure that they're equality policies and we make sure that there's non-discrimination against queer people, you know? Um, we make sure not just that there's a protection of sexual harassment, right? queer people, but also like that there's non-discrimination against queer people because there are some companies like Penguin Random House, for instance, you know, and it's a Bertelsmann company. So there's a kind of knock-on effect that happens. Um, there we have a policy that is basic, is based on the non-discrimination bill, you know? So there are things, there are many things that we're doing through policy to further queer rights that, uh, that aren't currently in legislation or in the law, but are allowed by it, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's like basically because I was also currently working under a professor who, who uh, like does a lot of queer rights and things like that. So I was specifically working and trying to like, uh, like trying to see what all benefits uh, a normal heteronormative family enjoys as compared to a queer people. And then I got to Know a lot of realities and a lot of sad things that that the laws still are not as progressive as it should be. Correct. Post post a uh, lot of amendments and post a lot of uh, nalsar or and and the thing that has happened. But the court and the government has not been very keen in terms of giving them those rights and and it it, it has been seen by them by their actions even uh, in 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 court in 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 different platforms when when they speak about things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Thank you Yeah, yeah. Nicholas had his hand up for, sorry, Francis, I've jumped in. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, Nicholas had his hand up for a while. Um, Nicholas, do you want to ask your question? Yes, and thank you so much, Mario. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, hello. I firstly want to thank you for taking so much time out and sharing this much amount of knowledge and wisdom with all of us. My pleasure. Uh, it's, it's really been a pleasure to hear you. Um, I and Zara have been married for, uh, we are an interfaith couple. We've been married for, uh, we're going to complete five years next month. And uh, we've primarily, when we got married in 2016 and later went on to get a marriage registered, uh, we had groups coming from both religions, right? It was after our marriage and uh, we've gotten a marriage right. uh, registered under the Special Marriage Act. 
I still uh, don't understand how that information gets out from the confines of that office uh, for somebody who's not related to us to have to feel the need to come to our house and ask questions whether you know was this done with the um, you know they ask our parents and did you know about this did you know this marriage was going to happen were you aware of it did you approve of it uh, I, I know you mentioned that you know this is the right to privacy is being discussed in court and i think just a few days back alabad high court also ruled um, saying that notice of such marriages uh, should be you know is should not be compulsory um, but is there a way that this can be more uh, there can be more security around this uh even if it is not completely removed the whole idea of putting up a notice in that 30 day period is there a way that we can remove this that is spe- specifically being challenged nikhil you'll be happy okay. to know that's specifically okay. being challenged there are various challenges across high courts and supreme court which presumably at some stage there'll be a transfer p- petition unfortunately well it depends moving into the supreme court right, right. um but taking away that requirement to have that 30 day notice and that you know one of the big arguments being that there's no rational differentia there's no intelligible differentia between your marriage to zara and ex's marriage to wife they're of the same religion you know right that there's no compelling state interest in publicizing such a marriage correct right? and in the love jihad laws they claim that is for the protection of the woman but for the protection of the woman then like let the i mean let the woman come and complain it's a bit like that triple talaq thing you know where the so muslim women go to court and muslim women say that look this triple talaq thing is nonsense get rid of it the court gets rid of it okay and then right. the bjp later comes up with a bill saying we are going to criminalize people who say talaq 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 now saying talaq 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 then means saying kabaddi 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 means nothing right so right in such a case to criminalize this person is um is is like saying that if i have a fight with my husband and i say i've had enough i want a divorce right or rather if my husband has a fight with me and he says this and we're muslim you know then that's a crime but if we're hindu then that's not a crime you know i mean Correct. it's just so it's that kind of so when you speak of women's rights in this context it's that kind of nonsense um but getting rid of that 30 day period is already there as far as protection goes look if you go to a high court the likelihood i think is that you will get the protection you know right. and couples like you and zara of course can go to high courts and pr- probably it's not that difficult you know um so everyone's busy and everyone has wants to just live their lives you know and, uh, and get on exactly. with it right yeah ideally I mean- you should be able to just tell the police police this lumpen character is outside my doorstep go and deal with them no Right. And if that happens enough, no lumpen character appears on your doorstep, bus. That's no, how I've, it happens. And, and I have had instances where uh, I've had very surprising reactions when I've told people that you know, uh, me and Zara have. I'm a Hindu and she's a Muslim, and we've gotten married. And there's this thirty second surprised look on their face really? that I have seen, and in multiple instances, and they want to ask me that question. you know why did you do this but they just don't anymore at least thankfully not in maharashtra and it's harder maharashtra. for women it's harder and it's harder women. for women it's much harder for women yes it's harder for women because then you're seen to be abandoning your religion and you know Correct. um because the presumption is always that the woman adopts the religion of the husband right you know why thank you so much thank you so much ma'am it's my pleasure um should we uh dick one last question or should we round up corona what do you okay very quick last question okay so uh the person whose name is sat do you want to ask your question thank you so much for allowing me to have a question thank you is it audible to you yes please yes, ask, please ask your question yeah yeah please thank you so much and it's a great pleasure like listening all of you on different issues so my question is like recently in kerala uh there is a like uh person like lady she took the no caste certificate yes ma'am are you I yeah ma'am you are i saw yeah. that yeah she's a lawyer yeah yeah she's a lawyer she fight for it 
yeah she took like after 7 years of regress file she got that so in future how it is going to be and how it is like uh, considered to be like we see now see, i have to look at the case more particularly but um but i also think that she's made a very important point by taking a no caste certificate but at the same time you know most people don't have a caste certificate for most cases for most situations you don't actually have to declare your caste no right? uh, fine yeah yeah true, what i'm true. saying so yeah. therefore i think what the point she has made is a very powerful point that she doesn't yeah. wish to be of any caste and then yeah. you know yeah. there'll be a hopefully a no gender certificate or whatever yeah, yeah. right yeah. um but i also think that we shouldn't forget that while everyone else looks at us, us through a caste lens right yeah. we don't have to we don't have to adhere to that we must yeah. recognize that um uh uh i would re- so i think we've got to recognize that there is suppression based on caste we've got to yeah. recognize that and that's yes. really important yes. because it's the privilege of savarnas to say that i have no caste firstly we have to recognize that front and center yeah right that's true yes um and then we have to deal with that yeah. but at the same time we have to make sure that caste is not as a result frozen and refined right yeah. yeah we also have to so to be clear that we should be moving towards a casteless society yeah you know yeah yeah so i think it's like any... taking these two things and progressing at the same time yeah like is there any policy on this uh, is in coming where days we can look on that like uh, so that uh, like we cannot uh, but i i think as per like we have heard these days we know uh, it's like more of a caste we are talking is coming up yeah it happens all the yeah. time it happens all the time but i think that um i think that looking at dalit rights yeah i think looking at dalit rights front and center is really important and through that lens looking at how to and learning from those moments and looking at how to emerge into a classless a casteless society i think that's the way to go um we'll take you know i've been trying to folks i have been looking at the questions in the chat um i am going to with your permission mario and others i'm going to pick one please yeah please go ahead um any predictions regarding the upcoming 25th february's delhi high court hearing yes i think the uh, the state is unlikely to let me not respond because they just want to drag it on even though the judge is getting a bit annoyed um then there's the paper please read it folks it's very interesting professor thomas's paper even post nafte johar we spoken on the uh, bhaskar's question yashank uh, ramteke it all boils down to alleged fascism what do you think about satire i've represented a number of comedians i've represented aib i represent i've been on kunal kamra's show shut up ya kunal i've represented some other comedians um i don't watch veer das so i don't know i don't know sorry comedians are now afraid of conviction everyone's afraid of conviction yashank not just comedians you know so how do you battle this fascism you have to organize you're part of the aipc presumably you have to organize and um you know make sure that positive values are fought for and espoused and make sure that there is that in states where the congress is in power you don't accept electoral bonds you do work for progressive values and you do um bring that love that we have been speaking of today um the love that has freedom at its core that has equality at its core and you bring it into politics and state policy and the law Happy Valentine's Day everyone whoever even if you're celebrating Day. by yourself No thank you Corona for um, for presenting that alternate vision of love uh, to us and we're so grateful that you're here I would like to um, hand it over to the Maharashtra state secretary of AIPC Zara um, to present the vote of thanks 
Thanks, Mario. On behalf of my colleagues, uh, the IPC Maharashtra President Matthew Anthony and the Vice President Sumit Gaikwad, I'd like to thank you, ma'am, Karunanandi ji, for giving us so much time and answering so many questions. I think these are questions uh, that arise from our need in life, uh, you know, as we go about what we don't know who to ask these questions to. There is a lot of fear now around love. So I'm so glad we had this safe space where everybody could voice their concerns and their questions. Um, our CEO, Alam Zaveri, for taking his time out and being a part of this conversation and taking all the feedback so that we can make some positive changes without a, uh, within AIPC before we try to implement them outside. Of course, the fabulous team of Mario, Francis, and Sham for curating yet another fantastic conversation, which I hope uh, goes beyond a conversation. And we see something tangible that can touch people's lives um, because it really does is a, is a matter of life or death for many people. And exactly. we may not realize it, but it happens. It genuinely happens. So if you're yeah. in a safe space, you're very blessed. Not everybody is there. And uh, to everybody who attended, thank you for your time. Uh, on the eve of Valentine's Day, I wish you all a very, very happy Valentine's Day. And I hope soon we have a conversation about love where the law is no longer in your way and you can love whoever you want, however you want, you know, and you have all the freedom to find your happiness. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Karuna. Thanks, Mario. Thanks, Karuna. Thanks, 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 Thanks,